Hi, everyone. Um, welcome to today's session on introduction to machine learning modules. My name is Moria and I'm the reactor program manager and I'm based in Tel Aviv. For those of you who are new to the reactor, the reactors are where technology professionals connect and learn. Uh, we provide programming for developers who want to advance in desirable high tech fields such as data science, AI and machine learning. Before we start the, today's session, I wanted to let you know that the session will be recorded and the recording will be available to you within a few days on the Reactor YouTube channel. I'm going to share the link with you in the chat box uh, soon. We also encourage you to ask questions during the session, so please feel free to post your question in the Q&A box um, and we will try to answer those during the session um, when possible, if not uh, at the end of the session. Uh, lastly, this is also a great opportunity to share your feedback with us. So I'm going to share a link to our survey for this event uh, with an event code. Appreciate if you can take a minute or two to complete the survey um, before you leave this session. Uh, so today's session is going to be delivered by Brian Slatten, and I'm going to pass it over to him now to kick off the session. So Brian, over to you. All right. Thank you very much and uh, welcome to everyone joining us. Um, I'm Joining you from Northern California, so it's very early in the morning, but uh, it's uh, it's good to be here and hope uh, you you enjoy it and find it useful. Um, so today we're going to focus on working with generating and working with models and by models in machine learning, we generally just mean uh, a way of representing some kind of uh, collection of input data and then using those models uh, and the relationships between the data to make predictions about other data that we ha maybe haven't seen before. So this is uh, after we have collected some data, after we have um, maybe done some cleanup, um, or as you'll see later in this, this session, um, we may still have to do some cleanup for our data sets. Um, but in the process, we, we are familiarizing ourselves with what's available, what's been collected, and then we're going to try to do the training process and um, go from there and make some sort of predictions. So this is a type of, um, it's, it's, it's a set of technologies that are associated with artificial intelligence, but they're not smart, right? They're not um, on their own, they're just finding patterns in the data. So machine learning is a general term that, acquire, that, that applies to a wide variety of fu uh, functionality. And some of those include the ability to make predictions, um, the ability to classify new data. So if you wanted to look at your opportunities and say that, look, this looks like a good opportunity or that looks like a good opportunity, or maybe look at your history uh, with your customers, you might be able to try to identify customers that prefer luxury systems or budget systems or you know whatever you're you're trying to figure out their goals so that you understand them better and maybe can um, give them offerings that are more attuned to what they're they're looking for so in in one case we're talking about like numerical predictions in another case we're trying to put things into buckets and make them um, you know make it seem like uh, we understand uh, make it seem like hopefully we will understand um, the, the types of attributes of our customers that allow us to think about them in these different buckets. So there's a, a wide variety of algorithms. We're only gonna cover a couple of them today, um, but you're encouraged to dig into and learn as many as possible. Um, a lot of times when I teach these classes uh, in person, students will ask me when they get a little overwhelmed with everything, um, you know, which ones do I actually have to know? And the answer is, un unfortunately, as many as, as possible, uh, because under different circumstances, the different models work with data better or worse than each other. So you're going to want to have as many of these in your pocket as, as possible to, to address these problems. Uh, the good news is we're going to talk about uh, a couple of models today, and they are all fairly fundamental and um, you know both kind of intuitive in terms of uh, being able to understand them and explain them to other people. And also they work in a wide variety of scenarios. So um, 
as a starting point, these couple ones, linear regression, logistic regression, decision trees, are all uh, very good for you to learn because they'll be um, used all the time. There's an old joke that you have to get up pretty early in the morning to beat linear regression. And um, but it's, it's funny because, you know, a lot of people are drawn towards more modern, fancy algorithms. Um, but if your data has a strongly linear component to it, um, it's it's really kind of hard to beat the explainability and the um, e uh, effectiveness of that approach. So we're going to go ahead and, and talk about that first. This is a type of pattern matching that allows you to look at some data that you have. And if you plot the data, sometimes you'll see that there is a relationship between some of the features. The, so the feature on the x-axis and the feature on the y-axis may have what look like a linear relationship. And that's, uh, if that's not a term you're familiar with, you can think of it as, as long as there's more of this, do we see more of that? So we would end up expecting to see um, a line um, coming through that. Um, and the, uh, idea is if we can represent that relationship with some kind of line then we can use the line um, to make predictions about future uh, results so the first thing what we need to do is we need to read in our data then we will uh, train it then we will make predictions now the reason we talk about linear or a line is because we're going to take you back to maybe your high school geometry um, where we, we dealt with lines. And you may remember the equation y equals mx plus b. That's effectively what's going on here. Um, the b in this case, what we're calling beta zero, which just represents the offset uh, on the y-intercept. The b1 is the coefficient. You may remember this as the slope, right? The m portion of the mx, y equals mx plus b. Um, this represents the relationship between the x and the y-axis, so feature y and, and feature x. And the line linearity of this model is with respect to the coefficient. Um, if we had multiple features in our data sets, uh, it wouldn't look like a line. Say we had uh, two features, um, we could eventually represent like a plane in that case, we might have a second coefficient, B2, and a second uh, feature. Um, and you know, you might say, okay, but it's not a line anymore, but the relationship is still linear. The coefficient and the features that we're looking at are still linear. And sometimes people will do funny things like ratios or squaring results, but it's still, how does the coefficient relate to the predictive power of the model? and that remains a linear relationship. Um, so we have a question, how do we look at the data? What methods do we use? I'm gonna go over that. So um, just hold on, we'll, we'll, we'll get there in just a second. Um, so the cool thing about the linear regression model is once we have this line, we actually don't need our input data anymore. And um, so this is a very efficient way of deploying this. Some systems um, with machine learning do require you to keep the data around so you can still try to connect um, to, to them um, and, and sort of like see how far the data points are from each other. But for our purposes today, once we have the linear model, we can make good predictions. So we had a question about how do we look at the data. Um, we're going to be using a toolkit. If you've been following along in some of these sessions, uh, we've, we've had several of them. Um, but the toolkits that are often used for teaching purposes um, are Python as a programming language um, for making Python effective as a numerics environment. We're using the NumPy framework. So that allows us to store large amounts of numbers in the underlying C engine for the, for the Python programming language which is just a much more efficient way of dealing with large amounts of, of numbers. Python itself isn't all that great uh, at doing that. So 
NumPy makes gives us the tools to make uh, numerical calculations um, pretty quick on large amounts of data. And then in, in this case, we're also going to use a visualization library called matplotlib. And that, that's going to give us the ability to look at our data and, and see some of those relationships. Now, because we're using Jupyter Notebooks, um, we're going to use a special command to Jupyter Notebooks to say, I would like to see the rendered graphs in the, the Jupyter Notebook itself here. Otherwise, it doesn't necessarily always know uh, that you want to show it in, in this particular environment. And then there's another library that builds on top of matplotlib called Seaborn. We're going to use in a couple places. And um, you know, we like to say that's it's kind of an opinionated piece of software. It's got a, a strong sense of a visual style and what do these graphs look like. And you can override a lot of that, but it also just makes it very easy to have nice looking and informative graphs of, of data. And then we're also going to be using pandas as a framework for reading the data in out of the spreadsheets and then treating it like a spreadsheet um, programmatically where we can pull out and look at the columns or the rows. So pandas is going to be our way of reading the data in. So um, we need to run these cells. So I'm going to import everything and get ready to go. Um, and then uh, we're going to use pandas to read the data uh, in. Now, if you again, if you've taken some of these other courses or read anything online about pandas, then you know that one of the structures that's most useful in it is called the data frame. And again, you can think of that like a spreadsheet uh, that you have a programmatic access to. So we're going to read in using the read CSV function. Um, we're going to we have a CSV file. Oh, uh, by the way, um, if you want to follow along, you can also go to the Microsoft um, Reactor GitHub and that is link will be shared with you. And um, in that. Uh, in that uh, space, we are looking down in a directory that is reactors, workshop resources, data science and machine learning. There's a data science two directory and a workshop materials under the data science two directory. And in that directory, you should find the uh, various Jupyter notebooks. These are called dot IPNYB. Um, if you want to follow along. Um, and then I just ran uh, visual code from that directory, but if you run it from the graphical interface, you could navigate down to wherever you have that directory. So in that directory, um, we have a data subdirectory, and in that data subdirectory is some housing data. So the idea is um, once you read the data into the data frame, you're going to want to explore what's in the data set. So how do we look at visualize our data? We um, in this case, we're going to read it in and then we run the head function that will show us the first couple of rows and then the overall structure. So we can see that we have a column called average area income. We have another column called average area house age. We have another column called average area number of rooms. So we can see that you know there's there are these various um, columns, and then each row represents an individual sample from our data set. So the overall number of rows is probably too high to look at all at once. So the head function gives us the ability to look at the first five. Um, the tail function would allow us to look at the last five in the in the in the data frame. Um, if you give it a number other than five, or if you give it a number in the parentheses. Um, that it'll show you that many rows, but it's again useful just for getting an overall sense of the uh, structure um, in in the data. Now, ultimately, what we're trying to do is we're trying to draw some kind of connections between the inputs, which would be the the features, the the aspects of the data that we see in in our data set, and some kind of outcome variable. So this is not a classification problem. This is a numerical prediction problem. And for something like a housing data set, the, uh, the thing that we're trying to predict is probably going to be something like the price. So we're trying to ultimately ask the question, 
how do the various features of houses um, in an area impact the price of houses in that area? So you could imagine, um, you know, wealthier neighborhoods, the housing prices would probably be more expensive. So if the people who live in an area um, have, you know, high salaries or medium salaries, you would expect that to be reflected in the, um, the, the, the types of housing that they live in. Uh, another feature that's in our data set is the age of the house. So depending on the type of neighborhood, the older the house, maybe the less expensive it is, unless it's in some kind of historic area, right? So maybe you have a house uh, like um, in the United States, Boston has some very old houses compared to other areas. So if you lived in a very old part of Boston, uh, in that case, the the feature may actually mean you pay more for for your house because it's you know the prestige and the historical scenario. So th we don't always know what which of the features are going to do you know, what what they're going to do to the uh, the price of the house. Average number of rooms. Again, you would expect the higher the number of rooms, the higher the price. And when you when you hear yourself saying something like that, or in a moment when we see something like that, you can generally draw the conclusion that there could be a linear relationship there, right? So some combination of these features into a mathematical model with linear coefficients for how important the features are uh, towards the predictive price, uh, that's, that's the general idea that we're gonna go through here. So um, once you read the data frame in, the first exercise that we ask here, if you're following along or going about this later, is to find out um, the overall st structure, right? What What is it about this data frame? How many columns, how many rows? And you've got a couple of choices for that. Um, you could say DF info, and that will tell you a little bit about the, the breakdown. So we see that, you know, there are uh, 5,000 rows. And there are, um, in this case, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven columns. Each column has a data type. So we're dealing with numerical ad numbers with the exception of the address. Um, another option for finding out details about the data is the shape feature, the shape attribute. So this tells us in a, in a shorter format the same overall information that we have 5,000 rows and uh, seven columns. This is what's called a Python tuple, in case you're wondering. It's just a, a fixed size collection of arbitrary values. Sometimes you'll see people uh, use this as the return of a function um, if there are multiple values that they would like to return in this case. All right. So another thing that the data frame allows us to do is to look at um, a lot of summary statistics. So what is the average price? What is the average number of rooms, et cetera? Um, and um, so um, Mark, can you share the uh, Jupyter Notebook, I mean the uh, um, GitHub repo link if, if possible? Um, all right, so there's a function on the data frame called describe that will do these summary statistics for us. And I'm gonna start off leaving this dot T off for a second. Um, this tells us very quickly for each of the features, what is the count? What is the average value? The mean is the um, um, average value. The standard deviation is a measure of on average, how far off is each point from that average value. Minimum value tells us the cheapest price. Maximum value, uh, or sorry, the cheapest, sorry, the lowest number per column. If we're talking about price, it would be price. And in this case, we're talking about income. So the, the lowest salary is close to $18,000. Uh, the highest salary is about $107,000. Uh, but it also shows us the various quartiles. So the 25th percentile, the 50th percentile, the 70th percentile. Um, it may not be obvious, but the minimum value represents the zeroth percentile um, and the maximum represents the hundredth percentile. So what that just means is there is nothing 
that has the value of 17, less than the value of 17,796. 25% um, of the data has this value or less. And then obviously 50, 75, 100% of the data have that or less. Um, so it's a question of whether it's uh, an attribute of the, the data frame um, or a function. So if it's a function, you'll see the, the parentheses on it. Um, okay, so this goes through and does the calculation for each of our um, fields, but sometimes it's easier to focus if we do what's called transpose the, uh, the, the data frame. So this is just going to basically rotate it so that our columns becomes our, become our rows and our rows become our columns. And for the purposes of the described data, it may be easier to see what's going on. So you see it's the same information. We've just kind of rotated it uh, so it's it's a little bit easier to see. So what's going on here is we're we're doing the we're getting the transposition um, on the result of calling the describe function. So the describe function returns another object, and then we're we're transposing that um, in essence to to see this other um, view. So we can see. Uh, now that we have some better understanding of the distribution of the values in the data frame, and that may help us draw some conclusions. Now, um, I'm I'm a pretty visual learner, and so it's useful to see things played out. And so what we can do is we can grab, say, each of the columns. So we have the price column, the average population column. Uh, we could grab those as a pa what's called a panda series, but it's it's really just the column, and feed that into a Seaborn uh, distribution plot. And so this shows us for that column, what is the distribution of values? Um, and for our purposes, um, we see that it has what's called a um, um, normal distribution. And a normal distribution, um, is generally one that has most of the most of the values fall in the average value. Some are a little bit more, some are a little bit less. But if you are able to represent this, um, this gives you a sense of how, what's the likelihood of each of these results. So the average value is. Um, Hey Brian, is, sorry to, to to interrupt it. Just that we have a question. If you can share the direct link for the Jupyter notebook, um, as well as the link to the Python notebook. So that's that's what I went over earlier. Uh, within the GitHub repo, there is a. If, so the did you share the GitHub repo with the students? Yes, I have. Okay. I have. I can so if, it you, again now. if they go there and either clone it or look down into it uh, through the clicking through the links, there is a workshops resource workshop dash resources directory, a data science and machine learning directory, a data science two directory, and then workshop materials directory. And within that, we're looking at the uh, Jupyter notebook called two machine learning models reference that IPython notebook. So. From the GitHub repo, you should be able to, to get down to that um, result. OK. So uh, what we've done is we've grabbed one of the columns. Uh, you, could, you could try some of the other ones. Uh, it's showing us that there is a normal distribution to the data. Um, if there is a normal distribution of the data, then we're able to make some assessments about the likelihood of the values. And so statistics uses this kind of analysis to say an expected value and the average value are are probably the same, right? Most likely, um, you we have the uh, the more likely things in the middle, the less likely things will be further away, and so we see this this shape a lot. Um, if you look at the distribution of heights, if you're measuring people's like bodies and and whatnot. We'll see something similar, like most people have a certain height. Uh, some people are a little bit taller. Very few people are a lot taller. Some people are a little bit shorter. Some people are a lot shorter, but it's not um, 
it's you know it's more likely that people fall within a particular range. So we see this shape a lot, and it helps us um, understand that there's not a lot of um, there aren't any outliers that we're seeing particularly, and that it's going to be easier to make some predictions because of this distribution. If you don't see that, generally you may want to collect some more data or transform the data somehow um, to to look for patterns that are give us some prediction like that. All right, so you could go through and look at the various features, and once you're comfortable that the distribution of values looks the way that you expect it to, um, then we can start to doing some, some comparisons between multiple features to see how they compare. So in this case, we're gonna do we're gonna grab each of the columns for the average income area, um, sorry, average area income, and uh, another one for the price, and we're gonna plot them together. And so this allows us to look at how they vary together. And we see some interesting things. Number one, we have the higher the average income, the higher the price. Now, keep in mind the price is modeled logarithmically here. Um, that's why it looks a little bit strange. Um, but the idea is uh, what percentage of the houses, I'm sorry, not what percentage, um, the, the range of values fits a little bit nicer here. Otherwise, if we're going to very wide ranges of values, um, again, you may want to transform the data before you start playing around with it. But this gives us a nice linear relationship, right? We see the more of this, the more of that, the less of this, the less of, of that. But we also see the distribution of the individual features plotted on the axes. So what we see up here is the distribution of the average income and here we see the distribution of the housing prices. And it's not surprising that where we see the most examples here around this value range and where we see the most values here around this vertical value range, that's where we see the, the largest number of uh, data points um, in, in the graph. So it's just, again, it's a nice way of summarizing the distribution of each of the features and how do the features vary together and this is how we can start to get a sense of, aha, a linear regression model here would be a good idea because we could model this relationship linearly. So we can also go through and look at all these combinations rather than doing them one at a time. A seaborne pair plot um, is a, as you can see, it's still running. It's a bunch of uh, images that we'll see, um, but it's going to go through and pair each of the features against each other. And eventually it'll get there. There we go. So in this case, we're, we're, we would be comparing average income for the area against average income. Obviously it would correlate with itself very well. So instead of showing you that here, that just shows you the distribution of the average income um, features. Um, so here we're comparing average income to the average uh, house age. Here we're comparing the average area income to the uh, average area number of rooms. Um, occasionally you'll see like these funny little bars. That's because these values represent the number of rooms. And there is not a continuous range of values. You don't have like 2.6 rooms for a house. So we basically have either, you know, four rooms, six rooms, eight rooms, 10 rooms. So that's why there's not a continuous range of values there. That's what we refer to as a discrete value. But generally what we're trying to do here is to look for relationships like this, right? So we see that. That seems like it's got a kind of a linear component to it. And it's those features that generally we're going to be successful using a linear regression model for. So the next step is to train the model. And for that, we're going to grab from our data frame all of the rows and the um, first six columns. The ultimate column, the price column, is the thing that we're trying to predict. So that's not going to be part of our training process, right? Um, because if it were, 
you know, we would just memorize the, the prices. So we are going to collect all of our inputs into uh, a variable called X. This is just a common notation. It means the inputs. And then we're going to grab the values for the price and we're going to call that Y. Again, just to mention generally the outputs. So we have the various columns and rows for each of the first six columns. Um, and it's six because we start at zero and go up to, um, I, I'm sorry, I guess it's five, five columns. Uh, go up to, but not including the, the fifth column here. So first value here represents all the rows using what's called a Python slice. Um, then this represents all of the row, all the columns up to the fifth column. If you're not sure, you can go through and check the shape of your, your data and verify what, what it is there as well. So now we have our inputs and our outputs, but we don't want to just use all the data. And that seems weird, but if we use all the data, then we have no way of measuring how well we do. What we're concerned about is that we're just memorizing the details. If I ask you enough questions about yourself, then I'll just memorize these details and that's not going to help me think of other people, right? Um, I can't take what I know about you and necessarily make good conclusions about somebody else. So what we're going to do is we're going to break up the data. Remember, we have our X rows and our Y outputs. We're going to break up the data into what's called training data and test data. And we're going to train off of the training inputs and the training outputs. And then we're going to test with the training, excuse me, the test inputs get plugged into our model. And then we can compare them to the test outputs. Those are the known outputs that we have for that uh, type of data. That's going to help us evaluate whether our model is doing a good job or not. If we just used all of our data for training, we wouldn't have that sanity check to make sure that it's doing a good job. So fortunately, um, scikit-learn, so NumPy gives us the numerical speed, Pandas gives us the data frame, scikit-learn is giving us the machine learning algorithms. It's just another library. Um, if, and, and if you're not set up properly to, to run these, some of the other reactor videos will help you do that. We just we can't go through everything all the time because uh, we want to talk about new things. So the um, scikit-learn library has a function called train test split and the train test split is just going to do some nice shuffling of the data and then say all right i'm going to call these rows training data and these rows test data and here are your inputs and outputs for those same rows so it's just going to the trouble of giving us a nice distribution and you can say i want the test to be 30 percent of the results you could change it to be 20 percent you can see if that changes the quality of your predictions. That would be a, a good experience uh, for you to try as a homework assignment. Um, and then the random state is just dealing with the fact that computers aren't very good at generating random numbers um, because computers only do what they're told to do. And it's hard to tell something to be random, right? So uh, it, it has what are called pseudo random number generators and they try to approximate randomness um, but for our purposes, we want random numbers, but we also want to see the same thing if we run our data set more than once. Um, if we're just constantly picking random starting places, then every time we run it, we might see something different. Um, so it's, it sounds weird, but the numbers are actually randomly distributed and we're sampling from them. So they reflect the underlying distribution but we're just trying to make it so that they are still predictable. So when we run it and then try to visualize the results, we'll see the same thing. It's, it's hard to build a model and then go tell somebody a story if the story that they see is not the same story that you're seeing. So uh, you could run it multiple times with different random starting points and that's, that's okay too. But this is just a way of fixing the random numbers so that they will come out in the same order, even though they're still randomly chosen uh, before, in essence, before that that process. So that's going to shuffle the inputs, split them up. 30% of the results will be test data, 70% will be training data, 
and then it returns it as a tuple. Remember that thing I mentioned above with the uh, rows and the columns? It's going to return it as a tuple, but we're just going to remove each of the elements from the tuple into separate variables. So we're destructuring the tuple into the variables x train, x test, y train, y test. So now that that's done, we can do our training. We're going to pull in a linear regression model from the linear model package of scikit-learn, and then we're going to train it. Now we know that this is a supervised learning activity because there are outputs. We're trying to say, how do these features connect to this output? If this were a uh, unsupervised learning activity, there would just be the inputs and that would tell us something like, you know, here are some clusters in the data, but it can't really tell us anything meaningful about, you know, a predictive nature because we haven't given any outputs to train against. All right, so, um, we have the linear regression model read in, and then we do the fitting. And this isn't a large data set, so that's as fast as it goes. Um, now it has been trained. We can plug in our X test inputs. Remember, we train off of the training data, and then we make predictions with our test inputs. So the predictions are going to be run through the model. It has a method called predict. And so for all of the rows in the test data, um, this is going to say, what do I think your average price will be? And then we'll capture those in a variable called predictions. If you want to see what's in the predictions variable, you can print it out. And so this is saying um, for the first row of our test data, it's going to predict a price of 614607. For our second row uh, of the test data, it's going to make this prediction. So these are the output predictions. And they have to stop and think, how can we tell whether we did a good job? Well, we could compare those output predictions to what the actual value is in the, the test outputs. Um, when scikit-learn learns something in a machine learning um, test, the things that it learns are available as um, attributes on the model with underscores at the name at the end. That just tells us this is something I learned. And so with a linear regression model, we're trying to find the shape of the line. And that's re then represented by the intercept, the B0 or B and Y equals MX plus B and the coefficient. And the coefficient will be um, an array because we have multiple features. So it'll be a one coefficient per feature. And so what this tells us is the Y intercept is negative 2646401. And then each of the coefficients is represented by these numbers. So you could translate that into thinking this is the relationship of our model. Negative 2,646,401 plus 0 0.21858 plus 0002, and each one of these coefficients will be multiplied against the row value per column. So remember, X1 is the average area of um, the income. So what we're doing is we're measuring the strength of each of the features, and then we're adding them all up together to make a predictive power. So some features may make the price likely to be higher. Some features may make the price likely to be lower. So if you had a small number of rooms but in a wealthy area the small number of rooms might make it less expensive as a house but the um being in a wealthy area it just might be a smaller nice house but a big house with lots of rooms in a wealthy area is probably going to be more expensive and so you can see how these various features might combine into the results now mathematically we can also measure the predictive power of the model because the linear regression score because it's a linear regression score that we're using um, there's a measure that we can test called r squared and this is a measure of the predictive power of the variables um, that we have and so what this tells us when we run for our test outputs and against our predictions uh, the answer is how 
how well do the predictions explain the um, actual values? And we see that we come up with a score of 0.92, and the goal is to be as close to one as possible. So that's not bad. And what we see if we plot that out is um, where there is a difference. So we're measuring the difference between the, the actual outputs and the predicted outputs. Most of them are zero. That means our model does a pretty good job. Most of the predictions are close to what they're supposed to be. Some are higher, some are lower, but notice the distribution is also telling us that we are, our error is mostly normally distributed around um, zero. So that's one measure of success. Um, we could also um, plot the predictions against the um, test data and notice that there's a strong linear correlation there. So that's that's good. That means the the more the test data is is the higher the prediction in our results is. So this shows us that we have a pretty good correlation between our predictions and our um, our actual results. So this is just trying us trying to get some sense. We we used the tool. It did some math behind the scenes. How well did it do predictively? Um, when you're doing these sorts of uh, visualizations, sometimes it's hard to see because all the plots are on top of each other. So as an exercise, try rerunning this with um, the alpha parameter set to something less than one. That'll make it slightly transparent. Um, let's see, how is the weight of the number of rooms considered? In other words, it seems like the predictive quality of each number of room is of equal rate, when in reality there are fewer. So um, there's a good question about uh, the number of, um, the, the distribution of rooms um, and whether that's weighted against the actual values. So um, we could go back and plot the number of rooms and see how they are distributed in the data set. And as the uh, person who asked the question um, suggests, we would expect to have um, more representation in you know, the average number of rooms than the um, higher number of rooms. We wouldn't expect there to be a lot of houses with 10 rooms in them. Um, and we wouldn't expect there to be a lot of houses with just one room in them. So the question is, if our data has more um, more rooms like that in the average value, um, are we weighting the, the the distribution of the values in a way that compensates for that? Now, more sophisticated models do that. In this case, the nice thing about linear regression is it's pretty easy to explain. The not nice thing about it is, you know, it does average a lot of results out. So in this case, we're not taking account of that distribution difference other than the fact that it's directly reflected in the data. Um, but all the features are mostly distributed using the same uh, shape distribution. So part of the reason why this was cho chosen for you know, a, a, tour, a class like this is because it, it is fairly clean data. Um, you might need to compensate for that in other um, distributions and other uh, data sets. So this is again why you can't just plug stuff into algorithms and then um, uh, hope for good results. Uh, you, you actually have to understand something about what you expect to see, what the population distribution looks like, how does your collected data look like that. And you know, again, you may once you find the features, which we, we did by looking for these these results, um, you know, we, we just chose all the features. Usually you have to go through the process of selecting which are useful. Um, then you want to go through and analyze the distribution of the features. You want to see if they are interrelated to each other. You may need to do some transformation to the data to amplify the signal that's there. So um, those are all part of the data science part of machine learning is, is cleaning up and, and transforming the results. So. Um, you do have to have people who understand that part of it. You do have to have people that understand the domain that you're trying to reason over. Um, again, why, why would we pick this particular model for a, a course like this? Because people generally understand the ideas. This is not like 
I would have to teach you some biology or something to to work with it. But the tools still work in all these different environments. But somebody's got to have an understanding of the the domain, uh, whether it's biology or economics or you know physics, um, to understand and interpret the results. Because otherwise, uh, algorithms may be telling you stuff that's um, nonsense but it's nonsense because you messed up your data collection process or something or didn't compensate for the the distribution of values all right so just as a as a reminder if you're watching this later the alpha is the transparency channel so if you rerun this um the uh each individual point is less Op opaque, so it kind of blends into the background a little bit more. Um, and the um, places where we see a lot more density, uh, that just kind of bleeds through a little bit more visually. So it's just it's a little bit easier to see what's going on. So the whole purpose of that little exercise was getting the transparency there. All right. Um, so what we found is that we could make pretty good predictions of the inputs based on the quality of the data that we had based on the, the fact that there were um, fields in there that connected linearly um, through a relationship captured by each of the coefficients. Um, and so if the data were not shaped like a line, if the data were not dist were distributed differently, then a linear model would be a poorer predictor of that. Um, so then we have another type of machine learning is called classification. So we're saying, OK, when we saw something like this in the past, this was the outcome that we saw. So therefore, in this case, I would expect to see that outcome as well. Um, we're not talking about a numerical prediction. We're talking about like putting things into various categories. Um, and so a logistic regression is unfortunately a um, actually a classification problem, not or classifier, not a regression. It's a historical name um, that I think confuses people to, to no end. But what we're trying to do is we're trying to look at the, the features that we have and try to correlate them to this outcome. And so behind the scenes, it's using a function called the logit function. Uh, you may hear it called the S-curve. But generally, we're trying to map this collection of inputs to either a zero or a one, right? If, if the curve is shaped like an S, for some low values, we'll consider that a zero. Then there's, a, there's like this transition point for some range of the values, and then other values will map to zero. So we're, we're trying to basically say, are you in this category or this category? We're, we're basically building a binary classifier. Um, and the classifier might be, you know, do you have a disease or you don't have a disease? This, this kind of thing is useful, you know, behind the scenes with COVID tests and whatnot. The, the, the tests aren't perfect, so they're a measure of, based on the elements that I'm seeing in the sample that I collected from you, does this seem to suggest that you do or don't have um, the, the disease? Um, so that's the kind of classification that we're talking about here. Uh, we're going to use a data set called the Titanic data set. Um, it is based on a fair amount of what we know about the passengers on the Titanic. Uh, there's no information about the crew. And then as as you'll see later, um, we also kind of discovered that this isn't all the passengers, but it's um, it's a pretty, pretty large number of them. And so this is available in the data directory for this workshop in a, another comma separated variable file called train data Titanic. So we're going to use pandas to read it into our data frame. Look at the head. And we'll see that for every passenger, we have their passenger ID, whether they survived or not. So this is the thing we're going to try to predict. Um, and then their class of travel that they were traveling under. So first, second, third class. We know their name. We know their gender. We know their age. Sib SP is the number of siblings or spouses aboard the Titanic. P arc is the number of parents or children of, uh, aboard the Titanic. And that may seem like a weird thing to track here, but if you think about it, if you're traveling with your sibling and you are in your 
mid to late twenties, and you get separated, then you're you know you're more likely to be okay with that because you think okay well I'll get in this boat you get in that boat um, I trust that you'll be okay. So a sibling relationship between adults would not be as perhaps impactful about whether you would travel together or not um, or want to stay together um, for say children or the relationship between children and parents. So that's my my guess as to why that's impactful you know in terms of survival rate is you might let your siblings go on their own you wouldn't let your children go on their own necessarily if you could avoid it um so then we also know um what their ticket number was what their fare was what cabin they were traveling in potentially um and where they got on the the titanic so it's Cherbourg, Queenstown, or Southampton. Now, um, once the data is read in, um, we can see that we have 891 rows, so we're calling the info function, um, and we see that we're missing a fair number of ages. We don't know how old people were. Um, we also are missing about 700 uh, cabin numbers. Now, that's probably not a problem because what cabin you're in is probably, if it's impactful at all, probably going to be highly correlated with what your ticket class was, right? If the cabin was located on a particular level based on being first or second class, um, I don't know that information about most of the data, but I do have the class of ticket data. So that makes it not a problem that we we don't have the, the cabin data so we're going to drop the cabin column um, when we do our training um, but we're also going to drop the name and the ticket because those are identifiers and we don't a they're probably not going to make a difference um, basically you know uh, john jacob astor the wealthiest person in the world was on the titanic and died and so if your name would make a difference you'd think you know, that, that would have impacted him as well. But we're gonna drop the, the name column, the ticket column. Access one means I'm talking about column names here. And an in place means I want you to go ahead and modify the, the data frame. So at this point, we've just gotten rid of those columns because we don't think they're gonna be useful for the um, predictions. And then we would wanna go do some exploration of the data. This is, titled the fancy name, you know, looking for multicollinearity. Basically, like I was saying, passenger class and the cabin that you're in and probably the fare that you paid are all related, right? Because you pay more for first class tickets. So we have extra data, but that's not necessarily extra information. They're all kind of telling us the same thing and that can complicate the predictive power of the model. So we want to go through and do that analysis. So one of the things we could do is we can compare the feature that we're talking about and then the this is the thing we're trying to learn or predict did you survive or would you survive and compare it to each of the columns so if i compare to the survive column to the fair column um survived is just you know yes or no but we can see that more people said no um towards the lower price of the fare. And so that's probably not surprising that, you know, first class passengers maybe had more access to lifeboats. Maybe there were more lifeboats. Maybe there were enough lifeboats for the first class people, whereas it seems like for everybody else that was not the case. So clearly there is a connection between fare and survival. Um, as you might guess, um, if you know anything about the history of this data set gender probably has something to do with survivability age probably has something to do with survivability as well because of the social norm of women and children first right so the features that we have possibly give us predictive power if we can find those kinds of uh, connections so if you're following along later or at home uh, you know go ahead and try to find a couple more combinations to see um, if you could find other cases where it's clear that there is some, some kind of connection. The group by mechanism uh, allows us to um, 
tie things together. So if I say, you know, group by survival, then we average out all the values for the people who survived against all the values of the people, I'm sorry, who didn't survive who, compared to those who did. And notice that the, um, the, uh, there are connections, right? The, um, the fare for people who survived tended to be higher. Again, not surprising, we, 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 we saw that. So uh, the average value of the uh, people who didn't survive, they, they spent 22. The average price for the people who did survive was 48. So between the, the classes of who survived and who didn't, we can do this nice quick summary. So this is the exploratory part. Um, we can see that on average, if we group by age, um, what was the survivability of these um, folks? So obviously, um, the we would expect to see younger people, like children, survive uh, quite nicely as well. So this is where pandas gives us a lot of, of, of cool functionality to group things by the various columns and see how that impacts the, the results. All right, so uh, I'm going to go a little bit faster uh, and I'm going to go a little bit longer, if that's okay, uh, Mara, um, just to get some more done here. Yeah, sure, that's fine. All right, so we have, um, we've dropped the name, we've dropped the ticket ID, the data that we have left uh, is the passenger's ID, whether they survived, the class, et cetera. One of the things that we want to do is to look at where, at where there are missing results. Again, to the, the earlier question, the distribution of values is, is impactful. So let's look at the value counts for the sibling spouse uh, column. We see that the highest rank is none. So most people were not traveling with uh, siblings or spouses. Um, obviously, we would not expect there to be, you know, too much more, depending on the size of the family traveling together. Uh, we see that the highest value, um, the highest count, no, I'm sorry, the, the highest count is eight. There were seven um, groups traveling like that. There were five people traveling like that. But most people did not have a sibling or a spouse. So the value counts function on the data frame gives us a sense of, um, how many things fall into each bucket. Same thing for parent and children. So uh, most of the results had a value of zero. So again, most were not traveling with parents or children, but um, we have one case of six, uh, four cases of four, five cases of three. Um, and then look at the gender distribution. We'll see that there were more men, almost twice as many men um, on the Titanic as women. Um, and um, that then also helps us understand the distribution a little bit. Uh, yes, the this will be available on the YouTube channel. The link will be available in, in a couple of days. All right, so we've gone through, we've, we've done some quick analysis, we've looked at the various features, we've seen how they connect to these outputs. Um, we've noticed that we have some missing data. So we can try to get a sense of how much missing data do we have, and this is a, a fancy way of saying how many columns have more than half of their values missing. So the first part, we're gonna, this is going to return which rows are null. And if a row has a null value, it will count as a one. If it doesn't have a null value, it will count as a zero. So then we're going to sum up all of the ones. That's going to tell us how many of those have missing values uh, for, for those. And then how many of those have at least half of their values missing? So the length of the overall data frame divided by two uh, is just going to say which are more than half missing. And we see that the only one that's true is cabin, which connects with what we saw above, right? There are 700 missing values. So that's more than half. So we're just going to go ahead and drop that column. So now we have our data frame. We have fewer columns because we dropped that. Um, let's we remember there were age missing values and there were um, origin or embarked missing values. 
So the aged missing values, we see that there are 714 missing rows. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, 714 rows that are there, 177 rows that are missing. So it's asking, is it null? And the rows that aren't null are false. So there are 714 not null rows. Um, we could just set the missing age values to the average, but to the, again, to the earlier question about the range of values, um, if there are more people in a certain group um, with a certain age range, which we saw earlier, uh, it might help us to fill in the missing values if I know some of the details about you. So, for example, I could compare the median value of um, men versus women. So we're going to group the data frame by gender, then take the age column, then do a median calculation, and then plot it. We'll see that on average, the men on the Titanic were slightly older than the women. So when I fill in the missing values, I'm going to group them by age and then uh, by gender, then apply a lambda function to fill in the columns with the missing value medians. Right, so the medians are going to be filled in, but it's going to be done so based on the gender breakdown. So that's going to compensate for the distribution of the results and say, you know, the median value, if you're a male passenger, is this. So that will be my missing value. And the median value for female passengers is this. So that will be that. We, we don't know the actual results. So we're just trying to recreate them with some of the same distributions that we're seeing elsewhere. So now this says the only rows that have anything missing is the embarked one. And uh, if we look at the embarked results, uh, the most of the pa passengers got on in Sherberg, I'm sorry, in uh, Southampton. So we can end up just filling the um, value counts um, with the, uh, the two missing results with the most likely answer to that. So you're not going to do that all the time, but that's, that's a tool that's available to you in the process. So finally, we're going to do a, a conversion because we need to turn this into math. And the algorithm is not going to know anything about Southampton. So what the get dummies function does is it takes the data frame, goes through it, and applies for the gender and the embarked columns because those were categorical columns it's going to turn them into individual features. So there's only two values for the, the gender column in this case, as, as the data is modeled. So that just becomes a one or a zero. So um, men will be re represented as ones, females will be represented as, as zeros. Notice then the embarked Q and embarked S ones allow us to encode which of the embarked values did you get get on? Did you get on in Queensburg or, or Queenstown um, or um, Southampton? And the impact is if you are in one of those categories, then the underlying model will reflect that. And then if that has any impact on whether you survived or not, that will be measured in the model. We have a question, why wouldn't you fill the missing values in with the same frequent distribution as the entry set of data? Um, in essence, that is what we were doing, but we were doing it with a finer level of granularity um, based on the fact that we'd already detected a imbalance in the distribution of gender. So we just took the same, um, we used that in information to say, um, follow the same basic, uh, the median value, you know, the middle value um, based on the gender grouping. So we are, we are in essence doing what you're asking, but um, with a, a, a finer tune, tooth comb. All right, so at this point, all of our features are numerical. Um, we probably should have dropped the passenger ID there as well, um, but we can look at the correlation matrix and this tells us where there is additional correlation. For example, uh, class and fare still seem to be quite highly correlated, right? There's a strong correlation between them. Um, so that's not surprising. 
And so we're going to drop the class if we're going to keep the fair. Um, I, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I, I can't. Uh, did I do what for embarked? There were only two missing ones for embarked. So uh, the in the one step or the two steps that in the cell above it chose the most common one. So I think it was Southampton. So in essence, yes, we, we used the information about the distribution of the categories for, for that, um, but there are only two. So we just set it to the, the most common one. All right, so this tells us, you know, there are some cases where there's pretty strong correlation. So we were going to get rid of P class because fair and P class are um, highly correlated. And we're going to get rid of survived because that's the thing we're trying to learn. So just like with the price one above, um, that's what we dropped when we did the uh, linear regression testing because that's what we're trying to predict. Survived is what we're trying to predict. So we're going to drop that from our inputs. But notice we're going to capture it as our outputs. We want to know whether you survived and we wanted to know whether your age, your gender, your, your fair class, whatever, corresponded with that survival um, rate. So notice we're doing a different type of machine learning. We're doing a category classification now, but the data frame is still the same shape. So we still can use the, the train test split to break it up into 70, 30 splits. Um, and now we're going to load in the logistic regression tool. We're going to fit the X inputs to the Y output. So again, this is still supervised learning. And then we can make predictions. So here's our test inputs, make predictions. And we have our predictions captured in this variable. So to wrap up this section, um, evaluating how a classifier does is different than evaluating a regression model. With the regression model, remember, we made our predictions we had our actual values and we just took the difference between them as a measure of how far off we were. Um, for a classifier, we need to look at what percentage of the classifications did we get correct? Did we get them correct by saying they were true, but they weren't? Or did we overestimate these? Like, well, how did we get these wrong if we got these wrong? And so we have a couple of ways of, of measuring that. So uh, we're going to pull in something called the classification report function, a confusion, ma confusion matrix function, and an accuracy, accuracy score. Um, all right, so those are three different ways of measuring how a classifier does. The first one uh, is a series of measures. We break up based on survival rates, and we say, in essence, how precise were you? If you said somebody was going to survive? Did they actually survive? Um, you know, that will, that's, that's going to give us the breakdown. Um, the recall says, did you find everyone who did survive? So one is a question of how accurate were your predictions? The other is kind of a measure of, did you find everything you were supposed to find? And then the F1 score is, is sort of the, um, the average of these, of these values. So we can see that, um, we're operating at about an 82, 83% precision. Um, and we did pretty well, given that we only cleaned up the data a little bit and then used a standard tool. Um, another way of looking at the results is called the confusion matrix. And again, this summarizes, I said you would survive 145 times. I'm sorry, I said you wouldn't survive 145 times and 145 of those didn't. I said that you did survive or wouldn't survive and you did survive 17, 17 times. So of the total, uh, what's that, 162, 145 times that I said you wouldn't survive, the passenger didn't. And again, we have historical data, so we know that. Um, 17 times I got that wrong. 30 times I got it wrong, I said you wouldn't, you would survive and you didn't. And then 76 times, I said you would survive and you did. So this tells us, you know, the people who didn't survive that we said wouldn't survive, the people that did survive that we did say that we would survive. So the good news is we're right most of the time. And that's again, a reflection of the same score that we saw above. 
um, we were wrong these 47 times. And then a final way of making this a little bit clearer is to put the column names in rather than, you know, just empty results. So this tells us whether we survived or didn't survive. This says what we said, we, whether you'd survive or not. And so it just makes it easier to read uh, the outputs. And then the final result um, here is an overall accuracy score. So this is going to iterate through all of the test results the actual Y test results and our predictions and see overall how, how, how they relate. And um, the actual calculation is up here. And this tells us that we had an, uh, basically about an 82% accuracy rate. So, you know, this is not something that we would want to, you know, necessarily go live in terms of like medical predictions with an accuracy rate of that. Um, but this also maybe gives you a little sense of when you hear what people are saying about the, the COVID tests and whatnot, um, we, um, we, we have to have a sense of, OK, this, this gives us some answers, but how accurate are the answers? Different tests are going to be based on different kind of underlying models, which are then going to make better predictions versus other ones. So you can kind of connect this to what's happening in the news uh, there as, as well. So. Um, we're out of time, so I'm, I'm not going to go over the, the last section, but um, we'll leave that as an exercise for you. It is a different kind of classifier. It's called a decision tree, and the notebook will walk you through, and we can use the same data, the same distributions um, of the data as before, right, with the train test splits, and uh, make, we can make predictions. But what this is going to allow us to do is this is going to allow us to say, how does the logistic regression classifier compare to the decision tree classifier? And basically one model may do a better job than the other. So this is why learning all of these basic approaches um, is, is useful. For mathematical numerical predictions, um, if you think that there is a linear component to your data, linear regression model is a, is a great place to first try. If you're trying to predict a um, Binary classification, like uh, are you in this part or that part of the category breakdown? Um, in this case, survive, didn't survive. In other cases, you know, has COVID, doesn't have COVID. Those, that kind of classifier um, can be modeled by a logistic regression model. It's not an overly sophisticated model, but as a, as a starting point, uh, it's pretty good. Um, decision trees represent the data differently. They come about the process of making predictions um, based on which features give it a better predictive power at each level. So it might determine that gender or age was very important because of women and children first. Not that it knows that beforehand, it's just that's what the data would reflect, right? Um, so the point is different classifiers may do better with one data set versus another, and we wanna be able to compare them to each other. So one of the nice things about the scikit-learn um, library is that it, is very consistent in how the learning algorithms are designed. So it's really easy to swap out one for another. So you'll notice we're still talking about fitting training to Y and making predictions and scoring the accuracy. So those are similar across all of the classifiers. Um, so then I could just simply say, I'd like to try a decision tree classifier. I'd like to try a logistic regression classifier. I would like to try a random forest classifier. Um, you create the different instance, train it the same way, evaluate the training the same way. So this will help you find um, for your particular data set whether things are, are, one is doing better than another, and then you'd want to take that and tune it uh, to make it as, as uh, accurate as possible. So, all right. Um, thank you very much for, for joining us. I hope you, you enjoyed it. Um, please do fill out the survey and let us know that will be shared with you. Um, again, if you go, if you weren't following along in person but want to go back, if you go to the Microsoft GitHub repo, under there there's a reactors um, repo, and then under there there was, one more time just so you have it, uh, we have reactors, workshop resources, data science and machine learning, data science 2, workshop materials, 
under there there's a series of Jupyter notebooks um, and the one that we were looking at was two machine learning models reference IPython notebook so uh, that way you can go back and rerun the two exercises that I showed you and then continue on and do the decision tree one there as well so thank you very much for joining us please come back for some future sessions and um, you know keep keep learning and stay safe thank you very much